welcome, welcome. I typically start on this side, okay. um, but maybe I'll start on this side and allow this last person to get here. So I'll start over here and just have you all introduce yourselves and go all around. Just say your name, you can say your grade, and um, your school. Name, school, and grade. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. For those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, uh, my name is Eric Green. I'm the superintendent here with Jackson Public Schools, and I've got uh, seven of our finest uh, scholars from across the, the district who have joined me for a conversation about reopening our schools. Uh, just a few introductory comments about this panel. This is the third of a series of three panel discussions that we've held. We spoke first with uh, several of our parents. We spoke then with several of our teachers. And now, of course, with uh, seven of our scholars. Uh, the point of these conversations is not to hear from within this conversation, this panel conversation, to hear from everyone across the district but to allow us to go a little deeper into some of the responses and the feelings and perspectives of these different stakeholder groups, um, a little deeper than we could go with the responses to the surveys. Um, and, and of course, we did launch the survey and we gave folks an opportunity to respond to those last week. Um, in the, before we get into some of the questions that we have, I'll have uh, our panelists to um, introduce themselves and we'll take turns going around introducing themselves. And uh, I'll just make a couple of introductory remarks with regard to our planning process and where we, where we are. Uh, I've mentioned before, but I'll say again that we launched a, a school reopening advisory committee. And that committee consists of some parents, of teachers, administrators, some of our central office uh, team members, members of, uh, we've got two scholars on that reopening advisory committee. We have some of our nonprofit um, um, uh, organization leaders, as well as some health officials and some um, city leaders on there. The point of that advisory committee is to uh, help us to understand more deeply the needs of our community and uh, some of the resources that exist so that the recommendations that are made for how we reopen schools is as informed as possible. Um, that, that committee has been working since last month uh, to, to, to move us through that planning process and to help us to get to a place where we've got a strong plan that is in keeping with the needs and the opportunities to serve our young people throughout the district, but also um, uh, taking into account the, the different needs um, of the different families without the, within the district. Um, we've done, there's several things that I'll just say up front so that they don't, um, we don't have to take up a lot of time discussing them now. One of the things is that we are uh, working to provide options for families so that um, based on the family needs that if you have a need for your child to be in school, there's an option for, uh, for an in-school face-to-face instruction. If you are totally dead set on your child not being in the physical school but learning virtually, there's an option for that. We'll continue to refine those, but. We want to start out with that, right? So no one will be locked into one particular thing. Um, we will ask you to commit over a period of time, likely a semester, but, uh, but, but you'll have an option for how you want your scholar, how families will want their scholars educated. 
Another thing that I'll just say right out is that um, we are moving to one-to-one, -one, one device per scholar throughout the district. We're moving towards that. We've gotten federal funds, or well, we're receiving federal funds for that. Um, we already have a number of devices within the district, and so we want to make that official and really start to uh, live within that, that uh, blended model of face-to-face -face and virtual instruction. I'm talking learn long-term. Our short-term plan will be uh, likely this virtual versus uh, hybrid or, or in-person thing, but um, we are moving towards one-to-one -to -one and we're excited to be doing that. Hate that we have to do it in this way, but we believe it's a good thing for our district and, and just for all of us as we, as we move forward with our learning. Um, there are several, several health-related uh, and safety-related uh, precautions that we are already working towards. Um, all of the uh, personal, not all, but uh, several personal protective um, equipment uh, pieces, and so facial masks and, and perhaps some gloves, likely not gloves for scholars throughout the day. Um, also looking at some um, um, partitions and uh, different ways to disinfect uh, using chemicals, using uh, some kind of uh, fogger, also using, uh, looking at UV light and that technology. The, so there are several things that we're looking at and, and already working on to ensure that if anyone selects or needs to select an in-person mode of instruction, that we're really raising the um, um, our level of, of, of safety uh, in those venues. Also with uh, temperature checks and, and um, distancing and uh, reducing or shifting the, some of the activities that we do with like um, cafeteria, scholars being in cafeterias or assemblies and that sort of thing. So I'm not trying to give you the exhaustive list of all that's happening, but just so that people know, these are some of the very basic things that we've been planning around since the very beginning. Regardless of the, the uh, level or the mode of delivery that, we, that families go with, those are some of the things that we're already working towards to ensure that if anyone is in the building, scholars, um, teachers, staff members, that we're increasing uh, our safety there. So I'll pause with that. Uh, there may be questions or, or what have you around that uh, later, but really want to now give over and, and give you some time and want to hear from you as to what you're thinking, what you're sitting with, what you've heard, and all that sort of thing. I'm going to ask the scholars to uh, pull the mics up close to you and uh, speak directly into them and go ahead and introduce yourselves with your name, your school that you represent, and uh, your grade level. My name is Dr. Anthony. I'm an upcoming senior at Provine High School. Welcome. My name is Cameron Yarbrough. I'm an upcoming senior at Callaway High School. Welcome. My name is Shaquayla Benson. I'm an upcoming sophomore at Lanier High School. At Lanier. Welcome. My name is Tyra Patterson. I'm an upcoming senior at Jim Hill High School. Welcome. It's Eric McNeil. I'm an upcoming sophomore at Murray High School. Welcome, sir. My name is Ramaya Thompson. I'm a rising senior at Wingfield High School. Welcome. My name is Anna Foreman. I'm an upcoming senior at Forest Hill. Awesome. So uh, I'll have to remind you because you all have such great uh, telephone voices. I'm going to ask you to really bring the microphones up as close as you can to your mouths um, and, and speak directly into them and speak up a bit. Even in the microphone, we still need to have you amplify a little bit. All right. So want to launch with this. So we're gonna be talking about some really important things this afternoon, but uh, I wanna start, well, start with this. You can call it a, a, an icebreaker. Uh, so this COVID pandemic has really wreaked havoc all around the world. Uh, it's a very serious situation and one with grave consequences, and we all know that, grave consequences. But in addition to the really serious nature to COVID, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, there's some smaller things smaller uh, aspects of life that we've been robbed of. And so one of the things that I'm really looking forward to on the other side of this pandemic would be to be able to go to a concert or a, a live concert or a music festival. So just thinking about for you, outside of just all of the, the really, the great seriousness of this pandemic, there's some other things that 
aren't life or death, but you kind of miss them. What is it that you're looking forward to doing again or doing for the first time once we move beyond this uh, pandemic? And wherever we start, we'll go to your left. Me? Sure. Okay, um, like for me, right off the bat, I, I love to travel. And my family, my family, um, we travel a lot. Like we had to cancel one big trip that we was taking in back in March because of COVID. And we have to cancel a lot of other ones that we already had planned. That's hard to think about because I don't have a lot of experience traveling and this was what my experience that I was gonna be getting. Wow. So that's what I wanna get back to. So you wanna travel, <laughs> all right. What about you, Anna? I wanna like go to the movies or something. I like doing basic stuff on the weekend. Just to go to the movies, something basic like that. Right, I almost forgotten what that means to go to the movies and sit in the movies. What about you, Joseph? Just hanging out with friends and family. Just being in, in person with folks, not on the phone or on a Zoom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what well, about you, Cameron? Well, for me, it, it might sound lame for some folks, but I miss going to school. Like school, outside of the academic part, just being with your friends and having that fellowship type of thing with everybody else, that's yeah. what I miss. I hear you. I hear you. Thank you. Jaquela? I miss going to school and also hanging with friends on the weekend. Hanging with friends. Pull your mask up a little bit on your nose. There you go. What about you, um, Tara? I like sports, so I miss going to football games and soccer games and baseball games and everything. All of that, right, with the large crowds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about you, Eric? Cam and Tara said just competing. Like, you know, I play for Murrah, so, you know what I'm saying, just big games on Fridays, going to school, really all of that. Yeah, I hear you. So again, we, we get it. This, these are not the things that are most important in life, but they matter to us. These are, this is a part of life, and so I'm with you. There's several things that I'm just looking forward to doing, looking forward to going grocery shopping even. And I don't love grocery shopping, but I love it even less with a mask on. So. There you have it. Um, let's dive in. So uh, as you know, we've been working towards coming up with our, our final plan for how we'll reopen schools. And part of the, uh, one of the questions that we posed on our survey was asking of parents and of our staff members what, which of the program options they, uh, they support. And so for you as a scholar, the question is, would you, um, which of the three uh, following program options would you be prepared to access, to, to participate in? In-person instruction, and let's start with that one. Would anyone be open to, I'm not asking you this one versus this one, would you be open to in-person instruction? Wow, all of you, okay, you can put your hands down. What about hybrid, which would mean part of the day would be, or part of the time would be in person and part of the time you'd be home learning virtually. Would anyone be open to that? All of you would be open to it, mm -hmm. okay? And what about virtual? All of your learning would happen virtually. Would any of you be open to that? All of the learning would happen virtually. <laughs> Not even open to it. Wow, okay, let's talk about this. Um, well, uh, uh, well, we'll talk a little more about it in, in just a moment. I wanna better understand some of the um, implications of that. How many of you have a dedicated device of your own or one that you could use mo much of the day at home? A dedicated device, laptop, something, all of you do, okay. And how many of you have reliable internet at your home? Reliable internet service at your home, everyone. Okay. What has been your experience? So you, we ended this past year, the fourth term, with a virtual, kind of a virtual experience. Some of you perhaps accessed the packets or, some, or something like that, but uh, what has been your experience with virtual learning? Does it work for you academically? Is it more? 
difficult than face to face or less? Just what are you? What's been your experience with it? Happy to hear from you. Start here with Cameron. Well, my experience with the virtual learning system, it it does not work for me. It not for me. Say more. As far as learning, I'm more of a hands-on type of person. So being able to be in the classroom setting and to actually interact with my teacher, that helps me learn. Gotcha. So when I'm virtual, I'm basically left alone or learning on my own, which is no problem, but it takes more to learn by yourself than when you in a classroom setting. Thank you, thank you. I think I saw your hand. You wanna mm -hmm. go ahead? So just like what he's saying, I'm, I'm a hands-on person too, and I have always had a connection with my teachers and stuff, and it's hard to like keep that connection through virtual because like you're not always having the Zoom call every day. You have it, like my teachers, they did it every other day just to give us a break from doing, being on Zoom all day. And that's kind of hard for me because it's hard for me to go and learn it on my own when I'm used to asking teachers questions when I have a question right then sure. and there. Sure. So that's, that's what makes it hard for me to just do virtual learning. Gotcha. Go ahead, Eric. Well, I was open to virtual learning last year because it was the fourth term, so that's when work is kind of like easier throughout there. You're just getting your last assignments throughout. But in traditional learning, um, the teacher is more like hands-on and she's more one-on-one, -on -one, so there is more guidance and like more assurance to make sure you know what you're doing and learning. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Anna. I agree with what they're saying, but for me, it's more so paying attention. Like when I'm at home, I lose my focus so easily. But at school, you know, you have teachers making sure you're doing your work, and it's like you can talk to your friends and still do your work. But at home, when I watch all watching TV, it's over. So, you know, like, <laughs> Gotcha. Attention, keeping your attention. Yes, ma'am. Shakela. Yes, I agree with her because I'm quick to get off of focus when I'm at home. So it's better for me at school when I have a hands-on learning teacher because I'm not a good learner when it's talk to me over the phone. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather the in-person. In-person, face-to-face. Tara? Um, I, didn't, I didn't like it at all because... Like everybody else said, I'm a hands-on learner, and if I have the option to get off Zoom, if I have the option to get off Zoom voluntarily, then that's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. so. Test. Okay. Um, like I was saying, if I have the option to get off Zoom without anybody telling me that I have to get back on or I have to be present, then that's what I'm gonna do, which is not necessarily the best option but sure like when you're at school once you're there you're there you have to stay all day unless you get a dismissal which is probably not gonna happen but yeah i if i have the chance to not be at school then i won't go yeah yeah i hear something about um discipline and and i can make some assumptions about you all just the fact that you're willing to come here and have this conversation with me I'm making some assumptions about your, you know, commitment to your own schooling and learning and whatnot. Could be right, could be wrong, but um, it's something to hear from you all that even with you, there's a question about your uh, being able to maintain your discipline and, and focus and, and all those things in that virtual environment. You were going to say something else for my? Um, yes. And like, like he said, it was the fourth term, so most teachers not really giving out a ton of assignments in the fourth term. And when you have to start over the school year, the students that wasn't doing their work at the end of that fourth term, because like the options that we had, you could not, you can get away with not doing your work. It's going to be hard to keep those students accountable, because I had a lot of people, I would tell them, we having a Zoom, or we, you need to turn this assignment in, they'll be like, oh, I don't need to do that. It's, it's already done. I'm already done. So it's going to be hard to hold these students accountable for doing their work like yeah. at the beginning of the school year on a virtual setting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, to be fair, that was under a different set of circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so going into the new year, there would at least be the accountability around grading. Yeah. Right? That would be different. But, but I think your point is still there. If you're, if you're not motivated enough to engage with the learning, uh, it's hard to be held accountable if you're at your home. Mm -hmm. um, harder to be held accountable. 
Any other thoughts on just your experiences with virtual learning? Yes, I, sir. I also feel like it depends on what class that you have the virtual learning in. So I had dual credit trigonometry. Mm. And I had to basically teach myself tree, which is not easy at all. But then again, I had a health class, which was easy. So it's basically depending on the class that you have online. Yeah. So. And just the challenge of the, of the content itself. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and to this earlier point about fourth, fourth term, you know, the way that the curriculum is paced, the new skills and new knowledge, much of that is taught in the first three terms. Mm -hmm. So the fourth term typically is the review and the deepening your understanding and maybe applying more of, the, of those skills, et cetera, et cetera. So it's even the, the, um, the content is different, right? Um, in that fourth term versus the first. So that's another thing just to be, I think to further your point, to, to uh, name there. Yes, ma'am. Going off what Cameron said, you know, like based on the class, some classes are like more serious core classes and they expect certain things and they don't put it all in their instructions. And when you turn it in, the grades not what you wanted, then they give you the instructions that you needed. But if you were in class, you know, they would have said it like to you out loud and you would need it on the paper because, you know, they told you. So it's just different when they don't give like the complete instructions. Mm. Okay. All right, I, I thank you for that feedback. Um, it's uh, interesting your perspectives versus some of the things we're hearing from uh, some of your teachers and certainly from some of our, our parents who are obviously uh, and rightfully very concerned about your safety and your, your health. A um, Couple of other questions here and then I've got some broader questions just to bring in some other thoughts that you might be sitting with. Um, Although we are taking really important uh, precautions to minimize safety risks and, and on our school buses in particular, uh, we may not be able to achieve social distancing between scholars or these, the amount of social distancing that folks might want um, or, or that's typically discussed, so six feet at least uh, of, of distance. Given that possibility, do you still or would you uh, utilize uh, uh, transportation provided by the uh, school district on school buses. Would you be open to or would you want to uh, ride a school bus given that we probably won't be able to keep you at six feet distance? I feel um, that like some scholars, that's their only transportation to school. So yeah, they'll probably have to ride the school bus. But long as they like have masks and stuff on, I feel like it's not gonna be as bad as like it's possibly thinking. Unless they're like, you have scholars that's not wearing masks and going all around now, that's different. But everybody should like be required to wear masks and school bus transportation don't last that long. It only lasts a few minutes to get to school. So that, I feel like, I, if same for me, I still will ride the bus to school. Gotcha. You, were you thinking about that? Yeah, I agree with her. You like, agree? What she was saying, a lot of children don't always have a car or their parents go to work early, so that's really their only way to school. So, I mean, the mask and like coming in here, getting their temperature taken, those are some little minor things we could do in order for the children to still ride the bus to school. And be, and be safer, at yes, least. Sir. Keep your, <laughs> you, were you gonna say something? I agree with both of them because based on my opinion, yes, many students don't have a ride to school or won't have transportation to school. But as long, I feel like as long as it's clean, like a clean environment for the kids so they won't catch it, it will be better with transportation. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, you m touched on something, Ramaya, that uh, I actually want to go to now. Do you support the consistent use of facial coverings, whether it's masks or, or um, face shields? Do you support the consistent use of facial coverings? And, and just you know, to name here, we know that there's some people, whether it's young people or staff members who have health concerns where you know, maybe asthma or, or some other respiratory issue where it's hard to keep a mask on. 
we know that that's true. Um, and we know that a five-year-old or a six-year-old will probably struggle a bit. You know, one of the things I said earlier was just to be able to go to the grocery store and not have to wear a mask. So even adults might struggle with it. But even with that, and given what we've heard and what we've seen and what we've learned in the news from health officials, would you support consistent, mandatory facial coverings in our schools? Eric. Um, yes, like at this point, it's become fashion. Like you see all of us have different masks on. Mine's JPS, hers, Lanier. You know what I'm saying? Hers, something about Meridian, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I support it <laughs> if it's mandatory, but if it's optional, it's always gonna be someone that's not compliant, but if it's mandatory, yes. What about others? Go ahead, Anna. It would be okay because like, you know, like, like you said, walking around the grocery store, by the time you get back to the car, you're like exhausted because you under the mask and can't really breathe. But just sitting here, like how we're sitting here, it's okay. Like, you know, the mask is just covering you, but you still breathe, you know, like you're not tired or anything. So I think, and when we sit in class, you know, like this not just constant walking around. So I, I would support it. You'd support it. I feel like, just like you stated, with people having underlying issues that they can't wear masks, I feel like it should just be some guidelines that they should have to follow even if they're not wearing a mask or something like that. Just in case we do have that. And like small children, they should like constantly probably use some hand sanitizer and they probably shouldn't be required to wear a mask all the time because they'll take it off. So it's just different guidelines that need to be followed. But it's like us high schoolers and middle schoolers, we're old enough to know not to take a mask off or stuff like that. So they, they should be like mandatorily required. Stuff gotcha. like that. Gotcha. Cameron? Uh, I have a question. All right, so if wearing a mask is mandatory, and for the folks, like you said, with underlying issues, when will it be okay for us to just, you know, pull down a little bit so we can get a fresh breath of air? Uh, so, I mean, that's a great question. And one of the things that the, the uh, team has been working through, first off is, as you said, determining what would be the conditions under which we would allow someone to do something different. Not, not wear a mask, maybe wear a shield, maybe uh, be distanced even further away from scholars. I'm making, I'm saying these now, these are some of the things we've discussed. Um, but what would be those conditions? Asthma, maybe it's asthma, maybe it's something else, maybe it's something else. But we first have to determine what those are. Um, we've also, uh, already started to create schedules if we are in person, learning in person, schedules that allow for breaks, that would allow you to go outside um, or to, you know, whatever it is, go to some place where you could be um, distant, distanced enough to where um, you can release or pull the, the mask up to, you know, breathe, breathe more, you know, without it. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're already planning through, and, and, and again, if we were in person and learning, those are some of the things that we would absolutely, um, we, we would all, and again, not just you scholars, I think adults, we would need it as well, because it, it just it gets a little uh, uh, cumbersome, annoying, or whatever, uh, but if, if it's in the face of, or, or in the name of um, safety, then obviously you want to take all the precautions you can. What would you say to, um, what would you say in response to the number of adults, and, and I'll tell you, there are plenty adults who don't believe that, um, not just our scholars, scholars in general, and not just the youngest, scholars in general throughout the, the grade levels um, would, not, would not follow a, a directive or, or a mandate to wear a mask or a facial covering. What would you say to that? Do you agree with that? That the majority or, or many of them would not do it or would not be able to do it? Do you agree or how do you feel about it? Yes. I um, disagree with that because mainly high schoolers have like more sense of knowing not to take off a mask when you're around a lot of folks. But like, like she said, with the younger kids, like you really can't not like try to force them not to take their mask off 
because like kids, many of them don't listen. So they'll probably take them off because half the time they'll probably play with them or they'll get short of breath. So I strongly disagree with it about the high school. So you think the older scholars would have, would be more disciplined and, and more um, willing and able to maintain the facial covering? Yes. Okay. And Maya? I feel like if there are some scholars or even adults that just don't want to wear a mask just for like no under underlying reason, they just like, I'm not wearing a mask, I don't believe in coronavirus, stuff like that, then they shouldn't be around us because we're trying to stay safe. And if they're not, then they shouldn't be in the environment. And like students, you know, they have to come to school. So if they don't want to wear a mask, they can go in this room and be in their room by themselves. You can learn, but you go be in that room or you can be on virtual setting. You don't have to come to the school. So that's what I feel when it comes to holding them accountable, like for wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? On, on just the, the, we've gotten a lot of comments. There are lots of adults who just don't believe that scholars would be able to maintain a facial covering um, in general. And, and sure, we call out specifically the youngest, but in general, there are concerns that scholars would not, and so that the facial coverings just wouldn't work in a school. Cameron, you were gonna say something? I feel like that the scholars uh, would now wear the mask because like, you, like we all have experienced, we've been robbed of going to school, being around our friends, we're basically quarantined. So now we get an opportunity to go back to the norm, but with a slight adjustment of wearing a mask, if all we gotta do is wear the mask, social distance and wear gloves, and we can still be around each other, I'm pretty sure that students will comply. Any other thoughts, reactions, feelings, comments for the adults who might be listening? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Tyra. Okay, so. Um, I believe that there are some, there are still some kids or even students or scholars our age that look at adults as role, role models. So if they see them wearing their mask or they're following the safety precautions, I believe that they would follow them too or spread, spread the idea to do so. You make a very important a very important point. Um, what's the, what are our role models doing? That's for all of us, you know, leaders, adults, even, you know, you all as role models for other scholars. What are you doing? Um, and, and how do we ensure that people see us doing the right thing so that they have a, a positive, a, a good model to follow? I hear you. All right. Um, Got two more questions here, but they're kind of broader here. Um, this first one, I just wanna, I wanna check in with you all individually. And the question is, or questions are, um, how are you feeling about the pandemic itself? How are you feeling about it? Are you, are you fearful and anxious about perhaps contracting it or being around it? Are you being extra cautious and disciplined right now? How are you feeling about it? Just Talk to me about your own perspective. Go ahead, Ramon. Um, I, as far as me, I'm not really fearful of the pandemic per se, but I am cautious of it. Like when I go in the um, store, I don't technically wear gloves, but I put hand sanitizer on every few times I touch some stuff, you know what I mean? I just make, sh and I always have a mask on. And my parents, with my parents, they keep, uh, they have kept us at home for the most part during this pandemic. So I feel like you just gotta be cautious. You, it's, technic it's not technically a fearful thing because a lot of people are not scared of getting sick. They just like, it's a regular flu, flu but it's really not. Mm -hmm. So I'm just being cautious so I won't get it or my family members won't get it. That's so how you, I feel. you see the seriousness of it. Um, and therefore, you're taking the, the, the necessary precautions to try to keep yourself safe. Yes, sir. Come on, others, talk to me. How, how are you feeling about it? Me as well, I'm not feeling you know, any kind of anxiety or fear about it. Just like she said, just being more precautious about the things that I do. And if I go somewhere, make sure I have a mask or hand sanitizer. And like, when I go to work, 
and make sure we have masks on and all the times and you know constantly wash our hands consistently so that if anything does happen or we contract something from a customer, it won't you know spread as much. Thank you, Cameron. I'm not really fearful of the virus, but my only concern is the people who have it without knowing. Right. All right, so you have the people who are symptomatic, and then you have the folk. It's just like a regular cold to them. But if I have a regular cold, but I still have COVID, and she doesn't, and I give it to her, she may be symptomatic, and it might be fatal to her, and I'm still living. So I think that's the biggest thing to me, right. people who have it without knowing. Right. Yeah, the... Um the, the, the stats about the people who are asymptomatic, that's the term, asymptomatic, you, you're just carrying it around, you don't know, and therefore, you know, you can unwittingly uh, expose someone else to it if you're not careful. Um, so you're absolutely right. That's a big heart to be considerate of, of other people, and that's really what we're called to do right now. You, it, the mass, the, the, the data and the science around the mask is less about me picking it up from you all is about each of us behaving as if we are uh, con we've contracted the virus and that our respiratory output could sh share it and put it out there in the universe with somebody else so um yeah that's that's the reasoning behind i'm not trying to preach to anyone but that's the reasoning behind the use of the mask less about me not getting anything from you it's more about me not giving you anything that i might have other thoughts on how you're feeling, how you're feeling about the pandemic, how it's causing you to behave. Are you, are you being consistently disciplined? Do you find that you know it's changed the way you think and your willingness to go out or, or any of that? Yes, sir. Eric. Honestly, when the pandemic like first surfaced, um, I kind of was like kind of extra with the whole pandemic. I kind of was extraly washing my hands you know, trying to stay inside, but sure. as I miss like normal life, I just, I guess comply with the whole mask, gloves, hand sanitizer, and like now that we're practicing with Murrah, it's like, it, it really just depends on how, how important it is to you. If, if you care about maintaining practicing, if you care about maintaining being around your friends, you'll, you know what I'm saying, put a mask on, keep gloves on, wash your hands, because that's what you just gotta do to maintain normal life and even go back to school. Like it's, it's really the same thing. Mm -hmm. Some sense of normality, normalcy at least. Yeah. What about you, Anna? How are you feeling? Are you, are you nervous and anxious about the, the virus? No, sir, sometimes, like it's been here so long, sometimes I forget my mask and I be like, oh, let me go get my mask, you know, like, I'm not really like afraid, but I don't want it. So, you know, of course I still wear a mask and stuff. So it's just, you know, depends on how you look at it really. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Anything else, Tara? Um, well, that's piggybacking off of what Anna said. It's all based off of perspective. So if you look at it as something that's important that you need to I guess you need to take heed to it, then you're gonna do so. But my. Okay, my concern is not necessarily the pandemic itself, but it's the teenagers that's going through it at home. Um, Cause I have some friends that are like going crazy because they can't go see their, they can't, basically have social activity with their friends or other people in general. So me personally, I do not like being at home and not being able to see people or greet people. Um, like not necessarily people I know, but just seeing people, hey, in the grocery store like that. Mm -hmm. So I think the mentality of some teens or scholars that are quarantined now are kind of getting destroyed based off of the pandemic. Mm. I agree with that. Yeah. There's lots of uh, discussion amongst um, educators about social and emotional needs mm -hmm. and mental health. You know, as much as we talk about physical health and, and hand washing and sanitizing and the masks and distancing and 
just all these things to keep us physically healthy. Um, there's lots of, of discussion now uh, about our mental health, all of us, all of us, let alone you all as young people. Um, because what I know for sure is from my own experience, you know, you don't live in a house with parents who are concerned about paying bills or keeping the lights on and keeping a roof over your heads and, 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 and keeping their jobs and all that sort of thing. You don't live in that household and not pick up any of it. At some point, you start to, to feel some of what your parents are feeling and their concerns about your safety, their own safety and, they, and yours, because they are concerned about you too. They want to do make the best decisions for you. And so all of this starts to impact us. And, and before you know it, you're carrying a load of stress and anxiety that you're not even aware of, right? All of that to say, part of the, the planning that we've, we've been doing is um, just thinking about how we support scholars as you, um, you know, if you were to come back together, well, regardless of whether you're coming back together in person or uh, virtual learning, how we support you in processing the stress, in processing the anxiety or any of that, just so that, you know, no one's sitting carrying that and, and not mindful of it, and then you start to do things that, you know, could, could be harmful, um, you know, or it, oftentimes, stress does take on a physical manifestation, headaches and sleepless nights and, and you know, upset stomachs and all sorts of things start to happen when you're stressed out. Just so, you know, you all know, th that's something that we, too, are very concerned about. Um, as much as we want to make good decisions about keeping you physically safe, we also want to be mindful that each of us might be sitting with some level of stress that could cause us to, you know, cause us some physical harm as well. Any other final thoughts on just how you individually are feeling about the pandemic and kind of where you are in life and the society around you? Any, anything else that you would want to share with us, adults, We're trying to learn from you? All right, so now I, I want to ask and then just kind of open it up. I would love to hear what are you hearing from your peers? What are you hearing from your peers? How are they feeling and how are they behaving? What are they doing? Are they going out running around with no masks? Are they staying home locked in their bedrooms, getting food served, and then they slam the door because they don't want anybody in there? <laughs> what are they doing? We'll start with you. I think your hand went up first, Shakela. Okay, so basically I have some friends that don't want to go and then I have some that do. But mostly, mostly half of them are saying they do want to go back because of us having to pass certain tests to pass to the next grade. So most of my friends saying they want to go back, but most of them just saying they just don't don't want to because of the, they think they're going to catch it. So, so there are there's some number of your friends who are concerned about actually catching the virus. Yes. And, and therefore saying, because of that, I don't necessarily want to go back into the school face to face. Yes, sir. And some others, you know, who feel differently. Gotcha. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kayla. Well, most of my friends that I've uh, talked to about this type of thing, most of them want to go back to school. For one, it's our senior year, all right? Mm -hmm. So we saw what the last class went through. They right. didn't get to have a graduation. They didn't get to have a prom. They had the first part of the school with the homecoming and all that, but if it fall down to it and we're not able to have our homecoming, we're not able to have our prom or graduation, that's a senior year going to waste, basically. Mm -hmm. So they basically just want to have that experience, get to have the experience that all the, the past classes have uh, experienced. Let me follow up on that. So um, I, I hear that, and, and I think lots of us were kind of grieving along with the, the class of 2020 and what they missed out on in terms of their, the end of their senior year. Do you think that people wanted badly enough to have that um, cause them to follow the rules, whether it's distancing or facial coverings and all the, to do that? Do you think that the desire to be, for those who do, desire to be back with their friends and to have 
the, the social outlets that, that also comes along with schooling, do you think that's enough to cause them to behave in ways that will allow for us being in person to, to work? I feel like people will do what they have to do to do what they want to do. Say that again for the people in the back. People? People will do what they have to do to do what they want to do. So if wearing a mask and a glove is all it takes for us to go back and have our experiences, of course, they're going to comply. So that's how I feel. You heard it here, Cameron Yabra. What else? Come on, what else are you hearing from your friends? Um, just and like what, just like friends. what Tyra said about the mental health. Like a lot of my friends, they, they, um, some of them are cool with going back to school, but some of them have been um having stress going on at home from like parents and things of that sort. So we do need the. We do need to um, make sure the mental part of make sure the students are mentally stable is put in place. And also, like he said, I'm an upcoming senior. I've been looking forward to my senior year since I got in middle school, I would say. And that's we we want to have our senior experience. And if we don't, that will also cause a lot of stress and anxiety and things on the seniors and different classes that might be coming up to be seniors. So we have to think about all of that. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Other thoughts, what are you hearing? Now I'm asking specifically about your friend groups, your peers, either folks, could be folks on your team, could be family members uh, who are scholars, really interested to hear what, what you're hearing and seeing of them. Well, a lot of my friends like to compete, like academically, so we feel that in virtual doesn't doesn't represent how smart we really are. Mm. We feel that the in person is how we how we show that we're, you know, our highest, our maximum of how smart we are. Like I think virtual shows a little incompetentness, if that's a word. Um, but I just feel I just feel smarter in person, like because I compete in everything I do. I hate to lose. I hate to be second. I always want to be first in everything I do. So if that's winning the spelling bee, if that's winning the race, you know what I'm saying? It's just, I just get that feeling in person. I don't, virtual, I didn't even have a, a competitive nature. I was just literally on the call, like just listening. And it wasn't, we didn't even have tests. I don't even think we had a test. So it wasn't, I just feel it's harder to fail virtual so I just feel like the teachers are just passing the students we get a we get a it's just a learning experience in 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 like in person gotcha gotcha there's something about the the competitive nature that's lost virtually yes from your experience at least yeah um, make sure I pull in some other voices before we come back around yes sir um, I also to agree with Eric, like he was saying, with the competitiveness in the classroom. Me, myself, I'm the type of person to compete in the class. I always just want to compete with my classmates to get a higher grade on the test or who could do this better. You know, just retain the information. When I was in ninth grade, one of my teachers did kind of help me to get the grasp of algebra because I used to didn't like math. But once I got in algebra, I used to start competing with my classmates and it just helped me get the understanding of what algebra really was. So I just feel like what he was saying, you know, the competitiveness is gone if you just at home on the computer, always looking up the answers. You don't know if you really know the information or not because you're not retaining it. You're just looking it up and going on about your day. Anything else? Go ahead, Rama. And um, with competitive, what about sports? Like my little sister, she is she's banking on getting the sports scholarship. She wanna get a sports scholarship when she goes into college. And for her, playing sports is like her life. It gives her life and motivation to go to school, 
to do better, to get good grades. It's give, it gives her a lot of things to do. And that's not just with her. That's for a lot of my peers. Sure. Sports is what motivate them. So I feel like we, we have to really think about that too because me, even me, I play soccer and stuff and I love doing it and it motivates me to keep my grades up because I want to stay on the team and different things like that. Right. So sports, we have to um, think about that too. You, you're exactly right. Um, there's, um, there's a strong, strong contingent of folks who speak specific, well, who talk about sports and typically they're talking about um, football and basketball and I think typically what you hear people referencing are boys football and basketball, but you're absolutely right. Sports more broadly spoken and, and thought of, and certainly for boys and girls, uh, as well as other extracurricular activities. I know we've got a strong debate team um, and debate teams are developing. We've got young people who are um, creating apps and, and they're in competitions and that, that sort of thing. Of course, band. Um, the marching bands and, and um, just how they show and the, and the choirs. We've got amazing choirs, amazing band programs, and they often you know, will go and compete in larger convenings and, and competitions and that. And so uh, on and on. I'm not naming everybody's sport and everybody's activity, but there, you know, there's many more where those came from. And, and so the point being, we know that th those aren't just nice to have. We understand that there's a reason why we provide those kinds of outlets to young people, oftentimes for the very thing that you just named. For a lot of young people, this is the thing that causes me to come to school and to give my best. Because I really enjoy playing football, playing soccer, playing softball, whatever it is, being on the debate, pe debate team. And so therefore, I, I also show up as a scholar in the classroom, because I know that's one of the prerequisites for me to play this sport. So um, I, I do want you to know we're, we're not ignoring uh, athletics and our extracurricular programs. The, the challenge right now is just to reopen school generally, let alone how do we create opportunities for folks to at least condition. And I know we're doing some conditioning now of some of the fall sports. And, um, also looking to you know, how we support our, our other programs. Those are gonna be continued conversations for us. They're not, there are no easy answers for it. And, and as you might imagine, the first time there's a case of someone, you know, a reported case of COVID, then folks wanna shut it all down. And, you know, I, I understand that. You don't want anyone else to contract it. Uh, those, just, those things just make it that much harder to, to try to lift up and sustain any of, the ex any of these programs, including in-school instruction, face-to-face -face instruction. We've got about, uh, about eight minutes or so, about eight minutes or so. Um, I just want to hear from you. Tell me what I, what I haven't asked you. Tell me what you think we don't know and need to be thinking about. This is your opportunity to, to advise your superintendent. I'm listening. Eric has some thoughts. <laughs> it's a question. Okay. So if we was to move forward on the virtual program, um, how would like food be provided to the, I guess, unfortunate ones who can't bring in food for them for their homes? We would likely continue, just as we did um, back in the spring, we would likely continue our, um, our meal distribution programs, but folks would have to come and pick them up. We were able to set up a, uh, a system where we, uh, uh, we prepared the meals, we uh, did the level of social distancing that would allow folks to have minimal contact with us but to still be able to get the meals. And, and so that's likely what we would do going forward since we've already built that program. And I know that that, you know, that worked for many and there are some folks that was still a challenge, but um, that's likely what we would be able to do going forward. Yes, go, go ahead. Um, so like, I understand that here we all got um, a computer and internet, reliable internet. And some y'all say y'all go give out computers and stuff to ones that don't have anything of that sort. 
So, but what about the internet? Most kids, some kids probably not gonna have the reliable internet, even though they have the computer or their phone, it's probably not gonna work as much as they need it to, to finish their online work or do their online things. Like yeah. I had friends that was like struggling with doing the online stuff and I had to help them out and help them out um, and teach them how to do different things with uh, online um, learning and stuff. So yeah. we have um, the nature and the education of those different things and knowing the, that it n might not always be reliable internet for some kids, we have to um, also keep that in mind. You're, you're absolutely right. So we, we got um, in excess of $12 million in COVID CARES dollars and there's another six or so million that's been, um, it looks like it'll be uh, allocated to us through the legislature around technology and infrastructure. So um, we're absolutely, uh, we're already uh, engaging with vendors to, to get more devices. So that will, that's a, that's a no brainer for us. We've got to do that. And devices that are consistent throughout the district. In addition, and, and devices for our teachers because they don't, uh, we don't, we haven't supplied them with the level of technology that they need from the district. Many of them have it, but not from the district. So there's that. As well, um, there are a few kind of uh, really immediate, short term, and then long term solutions around connectivity. The immediate is hotspots. I don't love that as a, as a solution, but at least it gets people connected right now. And that's something that we can, we can get our hands on. Now, um, the qu quantity of those uh, uh, hotspot devices, um, it's limited because everyone's getting them. Everybody needs them, you know, not just schools and scholars, but people from who are working and whatnot, they too are looking at ways to work from home. So there's that. We're also working with the city in partnership with the city and some uh, other partners to build out um, uh, more comprehensive Wi-Fi, wireless uh, internet, which is kind of the, sh the short term, sh maybe over the next couple of years. And then the city is also building out and, and working to expand the broadband, right? So that we, we will have even stronger connectivity over time, but that's a few years out. Right, that's a longer term thing where they have to dig and, and bury the wires and, and all of that and run them out to homes and, and neighborhoods and all. That's a longer term. Um, but in the shorter term, working with the city and using some of the funding that we have to build on our wireless connectivity. So, so it's not a, it's, I don't mean to make it seem a, like it's a simple thing. It's not, and it's very costly. And what seems like a whole lot of money is gonna go pretty quickly, especially when we start talking about you know, all the devices and even the uh, um, hotspots. But the, we've got the shorter, I mean the immediate, the short term and the longer term planning that's happening to expand connectivity for all of us. At least we are in an urban center though, where you can get to wireless connection, many of our Peer, your peers and, and my peers out in some of the rural areas, they can't even, there's no signal to connect to. So we've got some opportunities here, even with all the needs, we've got some opportunities here that, I've, um, that we can tap into. Go ahead, Shakela. Um, my concern is, what are we gonna do about the kids that really can't do the online work without really understanding it? And the, the state test is that some people have to pass to pass in this grade and they might not have a good understanding on what the teacher is teaching them over the phone. And like we were saying earlier, some kids can really, like we can really get dis distracted from our work to where we not really focusing on what the teacher teaching us because of us being at home and having more freedom without having to hear, get back on your work or doing this and doing that. Yeah, I mean that's, that's at the core of you know the issue around one of the issues around virtual learning. Um, you know there there are those who, based on what y'all have said and what we know, there are those who really need to have someone kind of standing behind them, tapping them on the back or reminding them to get on task or to turn the page, keep up with us as we're reading the text or, you know, let's move on to the next problem or whatever it might be. There. Plenty of scholars who need that. 
frankly, there are scholars who, who would much rather learn on their own and at their own pace. And that's actually one of the things that we heard, uh, one of the positive things that we heard from those who were involved in the Summer Boost program, that it gave them an opportunity to learn at their own pace. But uh, this issue that you raise is, is very real. And so we, our team is working through, um, there are plenty of districts that have already gone one-to-one -one and, and are running virtual programs. And so we're learning from others. What are some of the ways that virtually you can hold young people accountable for staying on task? How do you check for understanding after a few minutes of instruction or working on a problem or reading a paragraph or whatever? How do you, um, how do you embed some accountability throughout that lesson? Um, and how do you even break it down in chunks so that we're not on a Zoom call or, or, or Canvas or whatever it is for longer than an hour and you start to lose people because they're you know, losing patience or, or uh, focus or what have you. Those are some of the things that, um, there are folks within our district, there are teachers in our district who are able to do that well. And then there are some folks in other districts and in other places who have been, who've been developing those skills over time. So that's some of the work that we're doing um, in, in our district with our team to make sure that some of those basic strategies that we have that are across the district and uh, to, to build for all of us, building what I like to say, building a muscle for that kind of work. I have been on Zoom calls, I can't even tell you, I've been on Zoom calls so much over the last three, four, whatever it is, four months, so much all day some days that um, I've started to build up a level of stamina. And, and I get a little antsy. I have to stand up sometimes. When we meet in person, my team will tell you, I have to stand up behind my chair and stretch my legs and all these things. But you start to build stamina over time. And that's one of the things that you know, we, just, we all have to build, some stamina for, um, for learning. Because even when we, when we prayerfully, when we get beyond this pandemic, we will come to a time where we can be in person all day, every day. And the question is, do we really want to do that? Or, or do we intend to keep using technology in different ways to support the learning? And that's probably what's gonna happen in the, in the future, that we'll continue to infuse uh, technology there. Um, we're, we're about out of time, but you raise your hand, so I will take your question. I know this not a comment. This is not a really cor the, re the correct thing to say at this time, but my question is, when will it be okay to go about normal life again? What are they waiting on? Are they waiting on to stop spreading? Because it's not going to stop spreading. The flu been here since the 20s. It's still going around. COVID-19 probably been here since before time. It's just not surfacing. So if, it's, if they're waiting on to stop spreading, we're going to be waiting forever. So my question is, when will it be OK? Yeah. Brother, you asked some great questions. Uh, so this is my best response. And this isn't a canned answer. This is my best response. So obviously, um, you know, it's, it's very important that we find some kind of a vaccine or some kind of an, an um, antidote for it specifically for COVID-19. Um, and, and scientists are working, we're told, scientists are working on that and there, uh, it sounds like there's some things that are going into trials uh, to see if it actually works or could work um, more broadly. So there's that, waiting on that. Um, the more testing that we have, sure, the more positive cases we'll know about, but it also tells us all the positive cases that are out there. The more people who get tested, people tend to act a little differently at least when you know that you're, you're, you're carrying a virus or you're, you're sick in a particular way. You start to you know, do something about that. Then you at least, I think it was your point earlier, at least you wouldn't be walking around unknowingly carrying something that you can spread to your classmates or to your colleagues. So the testing is really important. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, you heard that whole campaign around, um, uh, what was it, the curve, flattening the curve. 
the point there was, you know, so we'll always have people who get sick, people who have viruses or other ailments that could be contagious. But the point is we need to at least be at a, in a situation where they're not overrunning the um, health officials and, and health institutions, our, our hospitals and clinics, because if they overrun them, then we don't have enough beds, we don't have enough personnel, we don't have enough respirators and, and other things. Well, at some point, it's like we, we, we just can't keep up. We can't do anything here. And then you start to see greater um, uh, uh, deaths because we don't have the, the wherewithal to treat all of these people. So I, I think it's, uh, from my perspective at least, it's, it's certainly those three things. There's also just kind of some mentality around just how we behave to keep ourselves and others in the community safe. But those are the three big things, an antidote or vaccine of some sort, um, more and more testing, um, and even understanding if you've had the virus and you're beyond the 14 days or whatever of, of I guess it's of incubation, when you're beyond that period of time that you've had it, to, to better understand, so does this now mean that I can't get it again? I think the jury is still out uh, on that. They're still trying to determine the degree to which having had the virus and having it in your system builds up some level of immunity. That's what I got. Listen, you all have been awesome. People have been blowing me up. I've been getting texts from uh, some of our colleagues saying how great uh, you all are, your questions, your comments your responses, thank you for your, your insight. As I said before, we have not finalized our plan. We needed to hear from you all, from the parents, from our, our teachers and, and staff members to better understand where people are, what the needs are, and, and what you're really wanting and needing uh, as we move forward. We're committing to getting a plan out pretty soon. Um, it'll be in the next few weeks. We, we committed by, uh, no later than the 17th of July. It'll likely be a little before there, but uh, we'll get that out as quickly as possible so you can be planning for what, at least for the first semester, what the first semester will look like uh, and, and the rest of the year. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you all. Thank you for um, all that you're doing just to be mentors and, and uh, role models to others. Thank you for your sentiments about the community, but also in the things that you're doing just to keep yourselves safe. We need you safe because we're expecting you back in the fall. I'm really looking forward to spending some more time with you, just um, hearing some more about the things that you're doing. Just